Hey everyone, this is Brian Ferguson. I know if you're watching this that you're enjoying the Bumps and Thumps podcast. In order to continue the podcast and get the guests on that everyone wants to hear about, we need support from listeners like you. There are a few ways you can do this. One is going to anchor.fm, which will be on the bottom of your screen here, and click the uh, support button. There you can make a monthly contribution uh, to support the podcast. There's also, our, we have a Teespring store. We have a link down at the bottom of the screen as well for that. And we have products such as t-shirts like this one I'm wearing, backpacks, glassware, and other great items for you to purchase. Those purchases go directly back into the podcast and get on guests that require financial compensation. Thank you again for your support. Go to those websites and, and support our podcast and we will continue to bring the guests that you wanna hear about past and present and thank you for your support and enjoy the podcast. Thank you for joining another edition of Pumps and Thumps, the talk of wrestling. I'm Brian Ferguson. My guest today has been part of the pro wrestling business since the late 1970s. He's had held numerous singles and tag team titles in many areas that he's worked in to include the NWA Florida Heavyweight Championship and the UWF Tag Team Championship, just to name a few. He is most remembered for being one half of the legendary tag team of the Killer Bees in the WWF and UWF with Jumpin' Jim Brunzel. He is currently the president of the Cauliflower Alley Club and has recently written and published a book titled Truth Be Told, the autobiography of B. Brian Blair. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. B. Brian Blair. Brian, thanks for coming on today. I really appreciate it, sir. Hey, Brian, it's my pleasure. Thank you for allowing me to be on this episode of Thumps and Bumps. Yes, it's it's a great show. It's a great day because, you know, a few weeks you'll be at WrestleCon. I'm excited to find I'll get to meet you in person, All which right. would be great. Super. And uh, I'm really excited about that. So... All right, let's jump into it if we could a little bit. You're originally from Indiana, from what I understand. The armpit of the nation, Brother Gary, Indiana. <laughs> All right. Okay, <laughs> we'll go with that. And uh, let's just talk about a little bit your, your childhood growing up in, in Indiana. Uh, what was that like for you back, back in the I day? I don't know how I survived. You know, I've been a believer uh for a long long time and i just uh, i can't even remember when i wasn't a believer um as a matter of fact uh some of my earliest uh fond dreams were or memories were <clears throat> when we used to go to the lutheran church in uh, gary indiana and uh one day my parents said uh to me uh i don't know how old i was like seven years old you want to go to big people's church i said oh yeah you know i thought uh, I remember I was excited and, and the pastor's uh, sermon was on the power of prayer and he's preaching and I'm just sitting there listening intently and he's saying, you know, uh, you can be anything you want to be, you know, um, God is in control of your life when you accept Christ in your life and you become part of God's family. And if you're an earnest person and you pray hard, God's going to answer your prayers. And so that really you know, hit home for a young tyke at that time. And um, I couldn't stop thinking about that. I went home, um, didn't say anything to anybody, just saw this is in my mind. And I'm thinking, wow, what am I going to pray for? What am I going to pray for? And I said, well, uh, maybe I'd pray for a million dollars. And then I thought, well, if I had a million dollars, they're going to take it away from me. Somebody's going to beat me up. You know, I'm in Gary, Indiana. There's some major criminals there. But uh, then I thought, well, you know, maybe I loved Corvettes. I built models, started building models with my dad. And um, uh, and I didn't, couldn't decide whether I wanted a red one or a blue one. And then I thought, well, I don't have a driver's license. What am I going to do with a Corvette? So scrapped that one, kept, it, kept thinking. And I thought, well, I know what I want to be. I know what I want to do. I know what I want to pray for. And I, I closed my eyes that night after much um, deliberation amongst myself and myself and um prayed to be superman and <laughs> all I said, right god please make me superman and i prayed and prayed and prayed 
So this kid, uh, Billy Kapinski, uh, we were uh, walking down the street and I told him about my prayers and everything. And even though I was jumping off the bed with a sheet around me and couldn't fly, I was getting bumps on my head from hitting the wall, you know, think, thinking I'm getting stronger and nothing ever happened. And he said, man, you're a fool, Brian. He said, uh, Superman lives on TV. He said, he, he's a fictitious character. He said, you're never going to be that. And so uh, when I go speak to kids, I show them a tape. I tell them this story. And I said, you know, I didn't, you know, I prayed earnestly. Uh, maybe I didn't quite become Superman per se, but I could hit the ropes like a speeding bullet, leapfrog a man with a single bound, have a 300 pound man jump on my chest and be here to talk to you about it today. And uh, just the costumes were different yeah so wow. you know gary was tough gary yeah. was really tough i mean yeah i remember seeing uh my cousins went in well we went over to chicago which is right next door and they were made me wait out in the car in this terrible neighborhood while they were in there playing pool for and i don't know if they were playing pool for pot or what the deal was but they came out with like this matchbox filled with this green stuff <laughs> uh, they start smoking pot in the front seat while I'm you know just a little punk and I just uh, you, you grew up tough you know I've had my butt kicked uh, by some big guys you know just for no reason they beat me up and uh, toughened me up it made me uh, you know everything that's uh, before you makes you who you are today so yeah yeah definitely all right. Well, let's, uh, did you go to college or anything after you got out of high school or? Yes, you... yes, yes. I actually was going to, I sold sodas in the Tampa stadium and that's where I first really fell in love with Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. And um, he was like a real hero to me, him and Freddie Solomon, who was a quarterback at UT University of Tampa Spartans. Uh, they were um, uh, during the four years that Paul played there. I think that was 68 to 72 uh he uh they were uh ranked number one in the uh, division one uh, uh rankings and uh football rankings and um, okay. so i dreamed about playing football there and signed a letter of intent out of high school and all of a sudden we i get a call and i find out that now they're going to fold football because they said that the athletic uh, that the football program was bringing down the scholastic uh, scores of the university and therefore they were going to get rid of. So I already, I had uh, an, another offer and had gone on a few different trips, but I wanted to go to Louisville second. So coach Vince Gibson there lined me up with uh, a guy in Dade city and um, uh, the coach there and uh, he was, he was a, a great, great guy. He, his name was Tilroy Morrison and he coached with Bear Bryant at Alabama. Okay. So I went there and played club football. We played Gallaudet and we played a lot of JVs like um, from the South. They, we traveled by bus, play um, Duke and uh, well, Duke's not stuff, but uh, South Carolina, you know, play their JV teams. And finally I went to Louisville on, on a ride and, it was a lot of fun. Quit my junior year because my first week in the, I was starving. The only money that I, I actually got, they stopped giving us our fifteen dollars every two weeks for our laundry, and uh, my mom every week sent me ten dollars, and that's what I lived off of. And you know, it was, wow. uh, I learned how to parlay that with a uh, offensive lineman a friend of mine, uh, Jerry Ward, who was a tremendous pool player. And we'd get our money together and he was a shark. I mean, he would, <laughs> we, we like, at one time we had like five, 600 bucks a piece, just pooling our money together and uh, him yeah. playing pool, winning money. Wow. And that was, that was like big money, brother. Yeah. So yeah, I did. Uh, I, uh, I enjoyed college a lot, but uh, my first uh, week in the business my first paycheck was 780 or 800 dollars 
And, you know, I was like, wow, I do not want to see a smelly locker room again at the University of Louisville. And uh, just uh, went on to some other smelly locker rooms. <laughs> yeah. Well, since you transitioned into wrestling, so you talk about Paul Orndorff, which if you're watching today or watching this, you can see he's in the background. He was a very good friend of yours. Absolutely. Um, was he kind of the inspiration for you to to get into that once you were in college or what 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 how that you know, I always eventually wanted to be a wrestler um i mean not always but for the for most of my yeah let's say since the time we moved to florida when i was like 11 11 and a half years old uh uh fifth grade um Gordon Soley, WTOG, Channel 44, Eddie Graham, you know, Jack Briscoe, Dusty Rhodes, Buddy Colt, you know, my heroes, you know, were just uh, heroes or villains, whatever. Uh, I just fell in love. I was enamored with wrestling. I, I just eat, drink, breathe, and sleep wrestling. My parents thought I was crazy. Anyway, <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> yeah. I understand that my parents... They were not fans at all. Um, I'd have to actually kind of sneak when they were gone or something. I would have to I would go down and, and watch TV because I knew the wrestling would be on. And if they would come back, they would, my dad especially, get off that stuff. You know, stuff's, you know, garbage, <laughs> fake. Get off there. So yeah. understand where you're coming from with that. So, oh, yeah. So There's some some so great stories. I know we're going to talk about this at the end, but in my book, Truth Be Told, mm -hmm. uh, you'll find uh, some tremendous stories about uh, about uh, the beginning of the business, which was uh, an amazing time in my life. Yeah, what a transition it is to go from just a regular person into you know becoming a well-known wrestler. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your training. Where did you train at and, and, and who trained you? I trained uh, in Tampa, Florida with Hiro Matsuda for um, three and a half summers. The first summer I, uh, when I was in high school, my senior year, uh, my summers between college. And, uh, you know, they didn't smarten you up. It was just, it was gut wrenching, you know, throw up every day. Uh, kind of thing at least for the first few days till I learned not to eat and um, uh, you know people would just leave out of that sportatorium and without their clothes without anything they'd run they'd leave you know they'd try they would try to hurt you and fortunately you know out of the, all those summers probably 100 115 people came through there and the only three that, and a lot of them that came through there are broken in other places. And um, uh, because it was just that difficult. But uh, Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff, uh, Terry Balea, Hulk Hogan, um, and myself, we uh, stuck it out through Hiro Matsuda's grinding uh, regimen. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're all alive. Thank God. Well, Paul's not. Forget yeah, it. Yeah, unfortunately, Paul passed. He's alive in my mind and my heart. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure he is. Yeah, you talk about Hulk a little bit. Now, I, did I was under the impression that Hulk's leg was broken by Hiro Matsuda in his I don't know first or second session with him, and then they had to sit out for a while. Is that is that true or is that? Well, it is true, but. Terry had already broke into the business. Okay. And, uh, and then he, you know, they kind of, they put him under a mask. Uh, we had our first match together in Chiefland, Florida. He had his, his first match. I had already had like, I'd been working for a month or so. And um, so we had our first match in Chiefland, Florida. And everything's a rib. Of course, I was a rib. Uh, There's a rib in almost everything. Of course, they... It was supposed to be a 15 minute time limit match and they changed it to 30 minutes and unbeknownst to us and oh gosh 
started out as a really good match actually mm -hmm. and uh got we had no gas at about what we uh thought was our 15 minutes we were giving it all and until we had nothing left so we were just like two two fish out of water you know oh, yeah. sitting there just trying to gasp for breath yeah wow all right well let's talk a little bit about your travel experience i know you did a lot of traveling especially uh you know when you were starting out i'm sure you did a lot of moving around from uh, town to town and i always some people i've had on here in the past have talked about you know when they drive four or five hundred miles with a with a veteran you know they they listen they're like a sponge and they and they try to grab all that knowledge and experience was that a similar thing with you as far as if you rode with somebody that really gave you that now who would that have been well probably my most memorable well of course riding with buddy colt uh a lot and the briscoe brothers they were my don morocco uh they were my real base knowledge at the beginning of the business and the first territory I went to uh, Mid-South. Um, um, we uh, hooked up with Murdoch and Cox somehow, and they weren't even supposed to be riding together because uh, Bill Watts <laughs> was so k -fing. And uh, they were always switching um, heel and baby face anyway, but <laughs> yeah, but the program was with each other. And they, um, they had a big bodied car, uh, like a big Bonneville and a big Pontiac. And uh, Paul and I would sit in the back seat, and Murdoch, Orcox, whoever was driving, would push that bench seat all the way back till our knees were touching. And they wouldn't, they were relentless. We had to sit like that, you know, 300 miles there, 300 miles back, whatever the amount of miles it was to the town. And, you know, Paul could have kicked both their butts, just you know. But of course, we respected our elders. And, yeah, uh, and especially if we wanted to move on in the business, you know, we had to take. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. I've heard uh, some stories uh, with your partner there, Jimmy Brunzel. His, some of his trips with Wahoo McDaniel, and they're pretty, uh, pretty interesting. I, I will say that. So. Yeah, Wahoo is crazy. <laughs> I remember I was I was working with Wahoo one time in Miami, and uh, we had a long match. I don't remember if it was an hour time limit, but it was about the thirty minute mark. I remember and Wahoo was really sweating profusely, and uh, he had this he had black all over him. And I said, Wahoo, what's that black stuff all over you? He just said, shut up, kid. And he turned me around and he chopped me. And I looked down and I got this black stuff all over me too. And I couldn't figure out what it was. And finally, uh, after the match, I went over to uh, Wahoo to tell him thank you. And uh, I look and he's got a can of spray paint. I see this black spray paint there. And uh, I didn't realize that, you know, he, you know, he's sitting there drenching, soaking wet. And now you can really see his bald spot. And uh, the end of the thing, you couldn't see his bald spot. So he used to take that black paint and spray the top spray. of his head. And I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. It's something new. That's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Chemistry with other wrestlers. You know, you've been, you were in the ring for a number of years. You've had a lot of different, uh, partners as a tag team or feuds with other wrestlers these are as a tag team or singles who in your mind when you wrestled against somebody was probably your most your favorite matches that you just guys just clicked you know just had that it factor and could put on a performance that you just felt wonderful about that no complication why is that tag team it would be the heart foundation okay and in single matches golly so many um you know i wish i would have had more single matches with bret hart um because you know our we had 
such similar psychology. Um, uh, but um, I mean, I have so many. I loved working with Jimmy Garvin. With um, uh, I'll tell you who was a great worker, a very underrated worker, uh, was Colonel De Beers, Ed Wiskowski. Easy Ed Wiskowski, what yeah. a tremendous wrestler he was. I mean, very underrated. Yeah. Jimmy Garvin, um, you know, Rick Rude, uh, Paul Orndorff, uh, without a doubt, Paul Orndorff. Uh, uh, him and I just really gelled in single matches. I'd have to say he was my favorite. Okay, interesting. Some feuds you guys you were in in the past. Which which one do you think was probably like, this isn't working, it's it's a flop. You know, you have matches, like you said with the Heart Foundation, you guys just click, and they were great matches. I remember those. Uh, what do you think as far as a feud when they tried to push you with another tag team that it just didn't, it just didn't click? It didn't work. Is there any one, any one in particular you remember? Well, even though we worked with the Sheik and Volkov so often, it was really, really work. I mean, because, you know, a good heel feeds you, you know, mm -hmm. they, oh, they feed you. Uh, if you ever watched uh, Junkyard Dog and Paul Orndorff, uh, watch sometime and you'll notice that Junkyard Dog doesn't do anything hardly. I mean, uh, they'll give Paul a clothesline, Paul will be up, he'll give him an elbow, Paul will be back in him, he'll poke him in the eyes, Paul will be back at him, he'll call a spot, boom, boom. You don't have to do anything. And uh, whereas, you know, the Sheik, you know, you've got to shoot on him to suplex him or to slam him or whatever and Nikolai you give him a clothesline or whatever and he'd take a bump in four stages you know to the knee to the hip to the elbow before he finally ever hits his back you know it's just uh those guys are very very difficult and as much heat as they would get it would be so frustrating when you know what you could have had you know it's like yeah. it's like having the most beautiful cake that you've ever baked and not putting it in the oven, you know, it's just, yeah. yeah, all the ingredients are there. Yeah. But you don't get to eat it. So I um, understand. Yeah. Sometimes, uh, you know, I've talked to others too that, uh, I don't know. Do you ever work with the road warriors? Uh, no, I never worked with, uh, okay. They were, they, I've been told they were kind of in the beginning, especially they were pretty stiff and, uh, even though they were over, but they were pretty stiff. And I, what you described with the uh, Volkov and Iron Sheik is kind of similar. So I just thought that was kind of interesting uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is, Brian. Big card events. You've been, to, you've been in WrestleMania. Uh, you've been in other big card events. What was that like for you? You were in WrestleMania, I believe, three. Is that correct? WrestleMania two, WrestleMania three, WrestleMania four. Okay. I was in the big event, the first Royal Rumble, um, the um, the first Survivor Series. Yeah, uh, you know well, we we were there. We were the foundation of what made the WWF. Yeah, before it was WWF. What what was that like for you though? I mean, you 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 walk out to that crowd, and especially uh, you know number three WrestleMania. There's ninety three thousand people. And Pontiac Silverdome. I mean, it was amazing. Yeah, I'll tell you, Brian, it was. Uh, I had gone up uh, before the matches early in the day, way towards the. They had the press area, about three quarters of the way to the top, and I went up there and I was looking around and. Um, I thought to myself, man, I, I'm watching the ring crew and I could barely see him. I couldn't make out who was who. And I know the ring crew, but uh, I couldn't tell actually who was who from, from there. It was so high up. And I thought who would want to spend the money to be here when you could watch it, you know, on pay-per-view. And uh, uh, then it's our turn and they had a, like these modified golf carts that took us to the ring and we're out there in a modified pair of underwear 
uh, in front of 90 something thousand people and uh, the electricity was so thick. I mean, you could cut it with a knife. It's, yeah. it's just the aura and the atmosphere yeah. is just something that, yeah. you know, you can't buy. It's just yeah, amazing, amazing. It looked amazing. I mean, I've never been to a WrestleMania. I mean, I've been to some other shows, but, uh, you know, it looked phenomenal it looks i mean it was phenomenal i mean there's no doubt about that so let's talk a little bit about you know when you were guys were in wwf the killer bees you and jumping jim why do you think in your eyes that you never got the push to get those tag team title belts because i think in my mind brian we were promised them, Brian. We were promised them three different times. And it was always, well, first, I didn't know Jimmy sued Vince twice. Um, okay. And uh, it was always Jimmy and Vince constantly had heat with each other. It was, it was never, it was relentless. I remember when our new uh, Killer B t-shirts came out. And um it, Vince brings him on and he's all excited. So when I first looked at him, I didn't really quite get it. I did after I, it, these same t shirts that are, let's see, behind me back yeah, there. Yeah, if you can see it, I can see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If so they're watching, so yeah. I, you know, you look at them and you think, well, you know, those are, uh, oh, excuse me, those are, uh, you know, you got to look at them for a minute. But I said, wow, you know, and I really look, wow, wow you know cool you know these are and jimmy went what the hell is that you know and you don't do that to to your boss that's so excited you know yeah yeah what the hell is that you know? yeah uh so you know just little things it would just dig and dig and dig and i just wondered why why jimmy bite your tongue because jimmy's yeah. a class act he's a good guy he, he is a good guy i love jimmy yeah i love him like a brother yeah and uh but um you know, it was just his way of doing things, and yeah. Vince didn't like it. Well, I know him. Uh, he has a yeah. His relationship with Vince wasn't the greatest. I, I know that I've talked to him uh, a few times. You know, and, and uh, but Jimmy is a great guy. Uh, I had the opportunity to spend time with him and Greg up in uh, Milwaukee during Crusher Fest last fall, and just wonderful guys. Uh, we hung out. They actually went out to get to dinner one night together it was it was great class act people so see why you you like him a lot he's a good person so yeah all right well let's you in 2015 uh you were awarded by the uh national wrestling hall of fame in waterloo iowa the lou Thez award mm -hmm. which is a high honor big honor big honor what when you got that call and they said hey you're you have been you're going to be awarded this what was that like for you oh i was very thrilled um you know it's nice to be recognized um for the work that you put into the ring and um i remember in 1982 i believe it was um when uh, dave Meltzer still has the dirt sheets but um I got the uh, uh, most underrated wrestler and I thought, you know, that's really nice. I'm glad. And, and you know, the, the actual uh, people vote on Dave's awards, you know, the reader, the subscribers. So to know that the fans appreciated really made me feel good because, you know, it's ultimately it's the promoters that dictate, you know, mm -hmm. who gets the belt, who wins, who loses. Right. And, um, you know, it's such a, a close edge. It's like when Vince put the WWF slash E together, he robbed all the territories. I mean, I was wrestling on top with Ravishing Rick Rude and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had been Florida heavyweight, two-time Florida yeah. heavyweight champion, ta Florida tag team champion, Southern heavyweight champion, worked with the world heavyweight champions. Um, and um, uh, Rick Rude and I were just selling out all over the place and so i was the top baby face in the florida territory and uh rick rude was the top heel so yeah. vince got us to come first me and then 
Rick a while later. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, he would just go in, whether it was, uh, you know, Hogan and um, Kurt Henning and uh, Bobby Heenan, you know, from and Jimmy uh, from Vern's territory, whatever territory he'd go in. And that was his success, taking their top talent, which were yeah. main events. And so anybody could have been a main event for Vince it was a, mm -hmm. so it just whatever his um you know whatever his thoughts were mm -hmm. with the people in the positions they were in yeah do you think when you guys were all there in the late 80s or mid to late 80s I mean you had in the WWF was you know they had a, everybody do you think it was how do I say oversaturated with talent because you could only do so much. I mean, there's only so many titles. There's only so many creative ways you can deal with people and, and put them over either as a heel or baby face. Do you think it was oversaturated? Uh, if anything, Brian, it was undersaturated. Okay. Okay. Because you could run three towns and sell all three towns out. Yeah, that's true. On the same night. I mean, so you just couldn't get to the towns and you still can't. You mm -hmm. can't get to the countries yeah. quick enough. There's yeah. so much money out there. I mean, now television is probably oversaturated. The, you know, you've got, in my opinion, because you've got uh, AEW and uh, WWE going head to head. And there's three hours of programming plus, um, you know, from each uh, of these companies. And then you've actually got 10 other companies on television. So uh, that's a lot of television, a lot of wrestling. I think, uh, you know, it was done before when it was regionalized and before cable TV, I mean, even cable TV, but um, where you had programs for that area, you know, like when you were in Florida, it was in Florida based fan, maybe in Georgia some, but you know, you had your fan base kind of like, you know, professional or professional teams, baseball, basketball, whatever, they have a regional network that covers them. Now, I might be on a national platform, a weekly show or whatever, but I think that's missing today that that uh, I don't know how you feel about that. I mean, you you were in that era. That was the era I I grew up in. You know, I had the AWA. I was in I'm from Wisconsin, originally born and raised there. So I watched AWA. But then in the 80s, when cable I had started getting uh, Georgia, Texas, Oklahoma, Florida. So I got to see more. I think that's a missing piece today. Uh, what do you think about that, Brian? Yeah, I think if you could regionalize it, it would be more fun. Um, the problem is, is the production costs and, you know, who's going to relinquish power to do that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. That's it right there. You just, the money, which it would cost, but they could probably afford it long term. But you just said it, the, the power, who's yeah. going to give it up. I think right. you hit the nail on the head on that. Also, you have the honor right now of being the president of the Cauliflower Alley Club. Now, how long have you been doing that? And what gave you that interest in becoming the president? Well, the first time I went to CAC was with um, Buddy Colt and uh, he was being honored and I saw what a great group of people it was and what a good time I had uh, along with Buddy and all of his family. Uh, matter of fact, I went out with his son last night, um, uh, Ricky. And, uh, you know, Ricky's a really nice guy. Uh, uh, and Buddy died last year, you know, in, the, in March. So God bless Buddy. He, uh, um, not only was he a tremendous heel, um, he was a tremendous psychologist, a tremendous worker, but um, uh, getting back to your your original question was again. Uh, becoming president of the college, oh, yeah, what, 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 what drove the, you to so, get there and, you know, and, and do that? Yeah, and so 
you know, being there with like a hero um, and seeing how everybody respected him and, you know, not that they didn't respect me, but seeing how they he was the honoree and, um, you know, meeting Carl Lauer and, um, you know, it was Red Bastine then was the president. He, he, it was uh, such a camaraderie. And then knowing that they were giving these guys, you know, the wrestlers that have fallen on difficult financial times are actually giving them money, not loaning it to them, actually giving it to them. I thought, wow, that's what a great group and what a, what a great organization. And I've always been a public servant minded person and mm -hmm. from coaching kids in baseball and wrestling and um, mentoring kids in schools and being a county commissioner and being in politics, you know, um, uh, you know, I've always given back and mm -hmm. enjoyed giving back. And I found a home in the CAC about eight years ago. Um, and um, it's just an honor and a privilege to serve uh, yeah. because to me, Brian, okay, I might not have worked, let's say, in the Portland Territory. Mm -hmm. um, let's say, uh, um, I just mentioned Ed Wiskowski, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Ricky Santana, uh, uh, Lynn Denton, the grappler, grappler, who was my first tag team partner ever. Oh, uh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, Lynn, De Lynn Denton was my first tag team partner uh, as a steady partner. Um, I think Gerald Briscoe was in a tag match in Florida, but, uh, Lynn and I tagged a lot in the, uh, in mid South and, uh, um, just, um, I don't, it's just, uh, it's, it's, uh, like we were all interconnected. Mm -hmm. in, in other words, when I left Florida, work hard to make sure they come in. Uh, territory stays healthy and we all did that for each other we all worked hard not just thinking that deeply but we worked hard uh wanting to make more money obviously but also a yearning to satisfy the fans yeah. and by by doing that by really wanting to work hard whether there's a hundred people a thousand people or ten thousand or more you work the same you work really hard and because those people bought a ticket and you owe them for making you a living. I mean, yeah. I'm very grateful to every fan that ever uh, supported wrestling, not just me, but yeah. other wrestlers. Yeah. And um, that's what's great about the Cauliflower Alley Club. We we support each other because we're a brotherhood, a sisterhood, um, um, just uh, people that understand the road and the business. Yeah, I had spoke a few weeks ago to Darla Staggs, a uh, fantastic Super. lady. Super. Uh, and just a wonderful person. I had nothing but wonderful things to say about you and and, and others. And uh, she, you know, she's the uh, benevolent fund uh, coordinator. Yes, she is. And I couldn't pronounce that at first. She had to do it for me when we were doing the interview. That was the best part. I kept blurbing it out wrong. And uh, but she's yeah. It's, it seems like a great organization um, from top to bottom. I've looked on your guys' website and it's it seems like a very class act organization and uh you guys do a lot of great things for for people and so and darla and every one of us um that volunteer we have about 30 people mm -hmm. volunteer uh they, everybody works hard nobody gets paid a nickel but the satisfaction that we get from you know helping others that are really down and when you know when they say thank you you know that's all you need and that, that's more than worth yeah. more than money you yeah. know when you know that they appreciate it yeah exactly yeah couldn't agree with you more sir couldn't agree with you more a few more questions and then we'll we'll let you go because you're a busy man so difference between pro wrestling when you started versus today what is the biggest well, one of the biggest differences there are is it's a lot more talking and rather than giving um, 
too much on television. It's all geared towards the pay-per-views. Whereas, yeah, you know, before pay-per-view, you're just working for that house, you know, for the next show and you're on the road seven days a week, seven different towns, sometimes nine and sometimes twice, three times at television. Uh, so, you know, theoretically you can have a dozen matches in a week. Um, so, you know, I tried to count my matches and it's way, it's somewhere between, you know, 5,500 and 6,500 matches that I've wow. had. And that's a lot of wrestling matches and it's very hard that's on your body. You yeah. know, it's just, uh, you know, thing that, things that come with the territory. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, the other thing that is different is the fans in Tampa aren't the same as they are in Toledo or, or Atlanta or New York. You know, they might be really enjoying chain wrestling. Uh, and you, another town you go to, you might have to, you know, pull out a machete to get them to pop. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just very different. And now they're cookie cutter matches. You know, they yeah. do the same thing in one town as the next town as the next yeah. town as the next town. And, you know, we, our craft was much more difficult like that because it was all psychology. You know, mm -hmm. we listened to people yeah. and we knew what to do. Good, good workers knew by the sound of the crowd and how to bring a crowd up, how to bring yeah. a crowd down, you know, it was yeah. good. And now, you know, uh, interviews are, um, you know, are written and handed to people. And so there's a lot more choreography, you know, even the matches, yeah. uh, we didn't we didn't do that yeah i so that's 100 agree it, it's yeah i'm 51 years old so i grew up you know watching wrestling in the late 70s into the 80s and into the 90s and it is a lot different uh successful yes but for fans like me the kind of the middle age guys i guess uh I miss that, uh, what we talked about earlier, regional, you know, like you said, the fan in Tampa is not the same type of fan in Toledo. Right. And so you might get a different version of those wrestlers in where I'm from, Rice Lake, Wisconsin, originally, versus if you were in Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I understand that that is a, a lost art, if you will. And uh I'm hoping someday something will come back, but it ain't it ain't looking like it. There's but. still guys that know how to do it. I mean, oh, yeah, you know, Randy Orton, uh, you know, guys like that. Uh, I, I think those guys that had their fathers or, or or a family member in wrestling during that time. I mean, Cowboy Bob Orton Jr. is probably to me one of the most underrated guys as well. I, absolutely. Uh, it, wow. it, and be honest, I mean, I'm not just saying that because you're on here, but I, I, I think you guys are, you know, you and Jim and, and some of these, Paul, you know, underrated, underappreciated in my mind. I mean, you may have made a big difference. You guys pushed in the 80s wrestling. You made it more, how do I say, watchable, I guess, because, yes, you guys had different characters. But you made it exciting. You made people want to get out of their seats, you know, and, and look and get that pop. There's still pop today, but I don't get out of my seat like I used to. Okay. Right. And I'm a wrestler. I watch AEW. I watch WWE. I watch uh, Impact. I don't get out of my seat like I used to. Or I don't lean forward into the couch looking at the screen like I used to when I was, you know, in my early twenties and as a teenager. So I think that's a lost art. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. One last thing, your book. Oh yes. Truth be told. Truth be be told. with two E's. The autobiography of Mr. B. Brian Blair. I'm really excited about this book because, um, Ian Douglas, who's tremendous, uh, he also wrote uh, Bugsy's book, Bugsy McGraw's book. Okay. Um, and um, you can't really read what's on the 
back um, here, but um, that was written by other people. It okay. looks like I wrote it myself. It was so good. Um, <laughs> and um, we've gotten um, all five star ratings, except one person gave it a four star. And somebody during the um, uh, during the um, book of the year, um, which we were a finalist. And, okay, good. Uh, so uh, um, we were a finalist in the book of the year, but uh, there was so much, uh, um, I guess, people wanting to be the book of the year or to be a finalist. Somebody went in and gave us a two rating. <laughs> so I know they didn't read the book, um, but uh, That's terrible. you've got like 35 stars yeah. and, uh, and somebody gives you a two, um, either, either that or they didn't understand the business i i don't know what i'm sure it was sabotage but yeah what can you do uh it is what it is we still made a made a finalist next to you know john moxley and his book mox mm -hmm. and um you know he's on live tv every every week you know mm -hmm. mentioned or either on it or mentioned or yeah. talked about or in an angle or whatever and, and that's hard to compete with you know and they're talking about the book uh you know on every show on every uh segment uh, mm -hmm. for a while during the promotion um, on AEW television. So, you know, we had a lot to go up against, but Ian did such a good job in taking my words and putting them uh, without changing the story, but just uh, articulating them in, in a very readable way that it, uh, uh, I I'm just couldn't be any happier. And I, I chose Ian because I read Bugsy McGraw's book, um, uh, Brute Power. And it was just such a well-written book. So, you know, Ian Douglas, as far as book writing goes and everything else he does, he's just a very, very talented guy. Yeah. Great athlete, just straight guy. Um, nice, wonderful wife, wonderful parents. Um, he, uh, He's got an MBA. I mean, the guy does everything. Uh, you know, without Ian, we wouldn't have been so successful. And quite honestly, Brian, every chapter could have been a book. I mean, yeah. we had to whittle it down to, you know, 400 and something pages. Yeah. Otherwise, it would have been a thousand page book. And you yeah. know, he's going to read a thousand page book. Not in today's world, they wouldn't know. Not in today's world, unless you're into uh, Harry Potter, right? Yeah, right. I want to tell you, um, folks, if you get a copy of this book, I'm going to get one. They're on Amazon. Uh, if you happen to be at WrestleCon in Dallas, uh, Brian, yeah, Brian's going to have them there. And uh, I'm going to pick mine up there because I want it personalized to me. Absolutely. So I'm going to get one. And, yeah, thank you. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, one last time, Mr. B. Brian Blair, thank you, sir, for coming on today. I really appreciate it. I know you're busy and taking time out of your schedule today to be with me. Thank you very much, Brian. It's been a pleasure, always a pleasure to see you. And uh, I look forward to meeting you in per person and yes. uh, Bumps and Bumps pod podcast. Uh, yes, thank you very much. You're a regular listener now. All right, good. All right, folks, thank you. If you're listening, if you're watching, thank you. And we will talk to you soon.